been with us here tonight to talk about this exhibition we're uh, sitting and standing in uh, called Off Nature. You'll notice the off, uh, there is a parenthetical around the second F, uh, and that's to highlight the tension between uh, us necessarily being part of nature while believing that we are somehow separate from or off nature. Um, so before we get uh, started and before I tell you a bit about Burn, uh, a little bit about our format. Uh, so we are live streaming on Facebook. So for those of you watching online, you can type questions into the comment section. Um, there's a bit of a delay between the uh, live stream and us here in the gallery. So if you, when you have a question or comment, please go ahead and type it in because if you wait until the end, we may not see it because of the delay. Uh, also, um, just so you know, if you've missed any of our recent artist talks, uh, all of our artist talks are posted on our YouTube channel, including videos of every exhibition um, and various event videos, so check that out. Um, so now a bit about Fern. She's a German-born artist, uh, as the name may uh, suggest. Uh, who's been in a uh, U.S. resident since the 1990s and now divides his time between the North Shore of Boston and Western Maine. His work has been internationally exhibited and is in numerous private, corporate, and museum collections around the world. Uh, he has taught at several American universities and colleges and in more recent years has been teaching mindfulness art workshops in Iceland, Germany, and here in the U.S. Uh, in addition to the type of work uh, that we see in this exhibition, uh, he also works on environmental inclusionary interactive projects and collaborations, uh, such as his engagement with scientists in a nonverbal dialogue as an artist in residence at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Uh, presently, Byrne is working at a studio in Maine, where he also works with his wife, Anne, who is here tonight, uh, on a 450-acre nature project, and he continues to give workshops both in person and remotely. And with that, I turn things over to Byrne. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Ich freue mich, dass ihr alle hier seid, dass ihr so zahlreich erschienen seid und dass ihr mich hier begleitet durch die Ausstellung of Nature. Now, I could continue like this <laughs> and you would probably not understand what I'm talking about. And that is exactly what I want to talk about, our inability to understand each other. So why is art, to me, a vehicle to connect? And beyond the connecting, it's also, of course, as a result, communicating with one another, right? So art is a language. Words are a language. When I speak to you in German, you recognize words, but most likely you don't understand their meaning. So you learn that language. Now, in the same way, up to a degree, we can learn the language of pictures. The language of pictures is not identical with the language of words. The language of words is an intellectual endeavor. It's thought processed. It's made in the thinking mind. Words are thoughts. Thoughts are limited. Thoughts are limiting ourselves from a holistic understanding of what is. Thought is very important. A thought is an object. A painting as it manifests itself on a wall, on a surface, is an object. But beyond the objectivity of a work, 
there is a transcending quality of that which we all notice when we experience art, not look at art, not think about art, but see it, feel it, touch it, if you're allowed, smell it, sense it with all your senses. And that includes thought. I trust there the Buddhist concept, the Buddhist tradition, which includes thought as one of the sensing agents. So why am I here? Why am, am I talking about art? And why am I talking about nature? I'm talking about art because that's what I've been doing all my life and because I feel that's what I can talk about with a certain confidence because I know what I'm doing. And I know that not by knowing intellectually only, <laughs> I hope, but also by direct experiencing of it, right? Why am I talking about nature? Because I am nature and you are nature. We are of nature. We are all made of nature. Now, we forgot that, and it is very banal in a way, but for whatever reason, our mind, our thinking mind, has convinced us that we are separate from nature, meaning, that's the second F, of course, we are distant, we are distancing ourselves from nature. We're creating a separate self from here, nature, and there, us, right? And that separation seems to have grown severely and in a very devastating way, as we notice when we open our eyes and ears. Uh, the, the idea of nature being a separate entity from us has brought us to where we are now. So, if I am nature, and nature is me, then art must be nature, and nature must be art. It's a very logical thought process. So if I am art, <laughs> I can play this game, uh, then I'm nature, when I'm nature, I'm art, we are all of nature, nature mother, nature is mother, mother nature. We forgot that and art can remind us of that connection, that connectivity or like the famous Zen master that you all know, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks of interbeing. We are not separate beings. We are interbeing with each other. Art can remind us of that. Now, here comes a, a tricky part. I think I should explain a little bit what I understand in, a, in the big picture of what art is. And when I talk with students mostly or friends or um, colleagues or art translators and, 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 uh, and, and transmitters, uh, like Kelly and John and, and all the wonderful people at, at Cove. Uh, 
when I talk about art, I mean A R T in capitals. And I said it's tricky because I don't want this to sound arrogant or separating, right? A R T is what I would call the overarching principle within which there can be all kinds of art regularly spelled. Uh, there can be all kinds of craft. There's no hierarchy in this is better or this is superior or this is inferior. However, art, A-R-T, only becomes A-R-T when that which transcends or, or is, is emitted through me is as pure as, as I can get it, as pure and, and sincere as possible. Now this is all relative, we're human, right? Uh, but the art that I mean, the A-R-T, is the one that I can trust because it's not contaminated, it's not altered, it's not for a specific purpose, it's not commissioned by anyone, it doesn't have any, any bad aftertaste <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> connection. Again, don't take this as an arrogant statement, please. I mean it as a holistic, as an opportunity to what art can be. So the art that is pure and raw and uncontaminated is that which I can learn from as I'm making it, and I do this for a reason, as I'm experiencing it, as I'm communicating it. The practice of that is what I call Arting, the practice of finding art is the practice of arting, like there is breathing and being, right? It's, it's, it refers to a, to a spiraling, to a continuing, to an, to an activity. Art is a practice which occasionally results in a temporary product. But that product is not what I call art. It becomes art when you or I or anyone that is opening up as much as she can to it, she gets into a dialogue with the work and then uh, the what I call art is the invisible part. It's, the, it's that what remains or, or that what appears in your mind or in your heart or in your soul or however we want to call that space that's spaceless. Right? So this is only some pain on the surface. It's of, it's of no relevance other than it reminds you of the opportunity to engage with something more primal, more severe, more deep, more original, right? It's through that interaction between you and the work that art comes alive. So for myself and for my students and for people I engage with, uh, through arting, I have come up with a little, little catchphrase, if you will, a little, little structure that I stole or borrowed straight from the old ancient traditions, in this, in this case, Buddhist tradition. Uh, it's called the Eightfold Path. Uh, the Eightfold Path is a, is a, is a wonderful, put together construct uh, of eight 
different ways of checking in with the quality of your presence. The quality of, of your presence determines the quality of your practice. The quality of the result of the practice determines the quality of the, 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 the value of the work to you. Does it, is, is there any, anything of value that, that speaks to me? So the Eightfold Path is my check-in, my litmus test, my, my, my um, questioning, my alter ego is, is my, my helper uh, uh, when, I, when I get stuck in the work. So many of you know that so-called Dharma wheel, it's eight spokes with eight different uh, aspects to consider. And I don't have to run through all of them. They would be too, go, go too deep probably, but uh, it starts with the right view. The right view is, is, is the foundation of, um, of any practice. Uh, if I live in, in, a, in delusion or if I make things up, then if I pretend that this and that is the way I think it is or I want it to be, then I'm not looking at it purely and with the right view. So I can check in with myself and say, well, is it really true? Am I really looking at this as open as I can? Uh, the second is right intention. What is my intention? Why am I approaching this? Why am I sitting here? Why am I going to the studio? Why, I'm, why am I doing this arting in the first place? Right? What is my true intention? And, and so it goes on. The, the third one would be right speech, and the right speech is is my language adequate? Am I talking bad about people? Am I, am I showing up uh, to myself, to my true self, also in my language? Um, the next one would be action, right action. Right action is often the action that is passive in the sense that I'm not acting but I'm aware that I'm not acting. So when I paint a painting very practically, uh, painting is a form of action, right? But sometimes non-action is, is very important because you want to let the paint dry and maybe you want to follow the paint move and grow and change and evolve and so sometimes the right action is not to act. Right livelihood, which is when you work in a professional gallery sitting, setting, uh, money is a part and money is, is an adequate and important part. It's my living, right? But is my livelihood uh, based on on my wantings, or, or is, it, is it more based on, on an option of giving and sharing and getting adequate, like, exchange for that? Right effort is the next one. The effort of effortlessness, which is a phenomenally put into one word, uh, wu wei in Chinese. Wu Wei is the effortless action, is the accepting, the letting go, the, 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 the letting it be, right? So the last two aspects are relevant for people that in one form or another meditate. So you check in with the quality of your meditation. Am I just getting out of bed every morning and, and sit and, and, and wait until it's over, till you can get your cup of coffee, whatever. Is that the right meditation? Or is the meditation uh, based on a, on a wanting, a purpose? 
and the last one is right concentration. And the right concentration is, is very, very essential for all arting, whether it be dancing or cooking or bicycling or drinking or painting or any inging. Right? So this is the Eightfold Path. And, and, and that is what I like to use as my guide when I'm lost and checking in where the problem might lie. And, and from there I usually get a little further, right? So this is the right practice. It's based on the Dharma wheel and it starts again with art and that's why we're here and that's what we're talking about all the time. A dot R dot T dot and A, another little vehicle that I created, uh, which is helpful to me, and I, it, I found it helpful to some of my friends and students and when I talk about it. A is for awareness. Awareness is the foundation. And then R would be realization. Uh, you can also say right practice, but right implies wrong, so that's a bit of an issue of that, of that Dharma wheel because they call it right action, uh, which is, I think everybody says that now is a wrong translation. Uh, it, it should be the wise action or the, or the useful action. So R is for the realization because we, we are aware and then we go to work. We do something that has meaning and we do it because we want to learn from it and so that, that is our right practice or realization. And T stands for truth because when I'm really able to do my work in presence and I claim I occasionally do and occasionally I feel connected and then I'm not connected and then, I, and then I start again so to speak. So T is truth and truth is something we find. Truth is the, is the natural process, the natural evolution of arting. Truth is not to be searched, it can only be found. And when you find it, you know it. And when you do your work as an artist, you know there are moments when there are no words and not even a feeling and if somebody would ask you, you could not put it into words. It's more like a, ah. And you know you have connected with your true self for a moment. So ART is what I call the big picture, which is nature. A dot, R dot, T dot is my vehicle, my kind of helping guideline borrowed from the Eightfold Path. And our ting is the practicing of all that. So, so far about that, are your eyes starting to glaze over or, or should I continue for two, two more minutes? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, art is about connecting. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm doing this, and that's why uh, Kelly and John uh, so, so gracefully invited me and, and to present this, which is presented so wonderfully by you, you wonderful, wonderful people that do such a phenomenal job here. So art is about connecting. It can only connect when there is somebody that wants to connect with it, right? So one way to do it is, is through phenomenal organizations like Cove Street, that people can come in for free 
and look at it and get inspired or stimulated one way or another. And so it's a, it's a service. It's a, a gallery is a bridge. Just like art is a bridge. Art is a raft. There's this Buddhist saying you, 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 if you want to go from one shore to the other, you, you get into a raft and you trust it, it will hold you and you, and you row across the river. And on the other side, you don't need it anymore. You just leave it there, right? Uh, because you, know, you don't need to go back. So art, I, I'm sorry if it sounds too arrogant when I'm pointing at my own work. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm just noticing that I, I'm, I should point at the art back there, which, which is what I see, what I'm looking at. Uh, anyways, art can be a raft. Art can be a bridge. Art can be a, a, a stepping stone. Uh, uh, what did uh, David White, the great poet, uh, uh, in one of his um, one, in one of his poems, "Everything's Waiting for You." Uh, David White talked about a dream letter to divinity. So art can be your dream letter. To divinity and and to some of you that listen to uh, rock music in the 70s and so 80s, uh, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> so we can get very sentimental, but the basic idea: art is a bridge, art is bridging, art is a language. And as I started speaking in German to you, uh, art is only helpful when it connects and when we allow connectivity to happen, right? We have to be available. We have to be available as any form of art experiencer, right? Not just as the so-called artist or the so-called collector. This is true for all levels of arting, of all levels of interbeing. Art, A-R-T, is one form. Meditation is another form. Anything that helps us get from one side to the other, from one shore to the other, or bridge separation, any form that helps doing that, un, unseparating us, reuniting us, is valid. So in times of desperate separation, that, that sounds like a real <laughs> real too heavy statement, but in times of separation, I think art is desperately needed. And, and advocates for art, people that speak for art, and people that practice arting and occasionally produce art are incredibly important to this world. I'm not sure if this can be a valid counterbalance but it's definitely uh, creating a little bit of irritation and disturbance. And so with that, I want to, I think, close this off and see if there are indeed a few questions and we can get more specific into any, any topic you like. Thanks. <clears throat> yes. I would love to hear you talk about the specific bodies of work. I feel like the work on this back wall is one body of work. And yes. Maybe the pieces on the end wall and this piece here yes. is related, but maybe a bit different. Yes, yes. Well, when I'm arting, when I'm working, uh, I don't think of a series or, or a specific project. I don't think of a specific space or gallery. I just do my work. 
And then at some point you promote the work or the work, work gets seen and the word gets out or whatever and some people connect and say, hey, I, I would love to do a show with some of your work and, and, then, and then you sit down with that person, in this case Kelly and I sit down and said, what, what do we want to show and, and, and what's, the, what's, the, what's the space like? Uh, so you have to limit yourself, right? And uh, I thought long, of, uh, I think quite often of titles uh, and I and I try to find titles that are open. So off nature was the the title that came to me very quickly, and and that became the umbrella uh, under which three different, indeed, bodies of work are presented that are very related. Uh, they're related in this case through space, the space in which I painted them all at, at Safford Farm in Western Maine, uh, and all painted over a period of, um, I would say, roughly a year. Uh, and of course, we couldn't show the entire body, but glimpses, so we picked a few pieces that we felt speak in the group and speak on their own. So practically, yes, three series um, and three different approaches into nature, into the fertility of nature, in the, into the uprootedness of nature, into the um, hard edge, like the pieces here and the ones that you can't see with the camera, uh, like the one, yes, back there. Uh, is on aluminum and it's scratched into an aluminum, which is a totally different physical act than, than letting things happen a lot, right? So canvas, aluminum, and paper, works on paper. Different approaches in regards to media, and surface texture and, and substrates and, and use of colors uh, and all related in a way that the inspiration is nature. But again, I don't like to look at it as, as me going out with my easel, like the 19th century guy with his straw hat and, and this romantic notion of, of going out there with your bottle of red wine and a baguette and a little common bale and, and, and you lay in the this, in this sun and, and under a tree and you paint this gorgeous mountain there. I don't want to distance myself from nature and and for me, what helps me best not to distance myself is to not take direct references. I, I soak up that when I open the door, that nature, but I want to be always aware that nature is in me, with me. I am nature, right? I'm not going out and paint nature or disturb nature or interrupt nature or kill nature or I try to be as much as possible in nature but that means to be as much as possible in me. I don't want to talk too specifically about surface uh, or like how did I do it. I rather like to talk about why did I do it and, and that I tried to explain in, in my earlier talk, right, about the connectivity and why I feel it's so important, the unseparating myself from 
the world, the connecting with you. Yes. Ani has a question. Das große Rasenstück, yes. Now that's very German again. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the Great Turf, which is a small painting, ironically, by Albrecht Dürer. It's a 500-year-old painting, and the guy 500 years ago painted these little bits of weeds in a beautiful watercolor, which you can see by appointment at the, uh, at, uh, it's a, at the Albertina in Vienna. And, and it's, a, it's a really small piece, and he called it the great turf, das große Ratenstück, the great, the important. And it's, all it is is a few bits of weeds. And the ones that you ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch, uh, and, and you're done. Um, so, Anya refers to that because this was one inspiration that indirectly triggered these pieces. Uh, and that's why I gave homage to Albrecht Dürer because they're called AD. AD is, is the initial for Albrecht Dürer, and AD, as we call it, also refers to a specific time, right, after Dürer in this case. Uh, and, and so they're loosely inspired. But there's much more, of course, but that would be certainly one, uh, uh, it's a good point, yes, that would be one, one trigger element. Another trigger could be a piece of music by Bach, or what you heard when you came in, when I, when I made this chapter be, be still, there was, there was a girl counting in German, uh, and that counting sounded like a takeoff for a, like a, a rocket ship. And this piece is by Johann Johansson, uh, a phenomenal contemporary composer. So, mm, Yes, das große Rasenstück is, is one, of, one of the series. Uh, the little watercolors uh, I call Jungle Book uh, because they remind me of my early childhood when I created these fantasy environments. Uh, and, and, and the jungle was a little scary and lush at the same time and, and Little, little, uh, a wondrous land, and and that refers to my probably my first series of of works that was about a blade of grass, and that was in upstate New York um, in my early thirties or late twenties. Uh, and, and, and there were these tall grasses at the river, the Genesee River, very, very tall, and, and I walked through them and I suddenly had this realization, wow, this is exactly when you were like this old and, 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 and walking through the grass and finding your way. And, and uh, so that became, I think the first exploration of that, a single blade of grass. Uh, ten years later, I, I, I read uh, uh, Thoreau and, and Whitman in this case, and, and, and Emerson, and these great important naturalists in this country, which, which, which followed uh, the great romantic movement in Europe, specifically Germany, like the early 19th and mid 19th century, Caspar David Friedrich, and the philosophers that came with that, which 
would be Schopenhauer on the very top and a bunch of others. Yes. Sorry, this was a long answer, but he talks about my beginning and he talks about the different groups a little bit and specifically. Yes. My favorite way. When you're in between, you live on a farm and you live on the North Shore. What do your practices inspire? I like my my favorite practice. My favorite direct connecting with nature is walking out barefoot in March uh, across the field in my bathrobe and. And sometimes I'm a little little decadent, I bring my tea. <laughs> but it's an immediate connection because you, f you, you, you feel, you, I mean, you, f you feel every bit of stone and earth. Uh, but in March and in April and in May, as you know here, uh, uh, you feel the cold and, and it's an incredible presencing agent, bomb. So that would be my most wonderful contemplative <laughs> experience would be canoeing on a river at dusk or when the fog just rises, like at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Yes. That's very I I I exclusive. It sounds a little, little, like a dec little decadent because I'm, I'm totally aware that a lot of people cannot do that. Yes. Yes. Are you, do you have experience with creating art when you're sort of divorced from that uh, idea of nature and the environment? You see some artists that are, are able to create art and sort of a complete disconnection from the environment. Yes. Um, can you speak to that, whether you're able to you have a desire to create when you're not in that place of connection? Uh, creating is, is being found, letting, letting yourself being found. Uh, that leads to creating. It, 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 it starts with a certain curiosity uh, and then open awareness must come in and then something might happen but I don't think I can go out and create something uh, it, it's it, it must happen to me it's a happening that's why I call it painting or arting right so this would be one I don't know answer. I don't, maybe another, uh, I don't trust mirroring. Uh, in, in the Buddhist practice, the mirror is a beautiful example for not being biased, not being, having an opinion, just, just being there. It's just, it, it, it's just reflecting. The mirror doesn't care what the mirror sees. The, the mirror is just reflecting. Art thing is, is not just mirroring. It does bring in your presence. And your presence is always different from anybody else's presence to a degree. And my presence today and right now is very different from my presence tomorrow or yesterday, right? So, uh, the the unpredictable, the unknown, the unknowing is an essential part of our thing. And the mirror cannot do that. Uh, I wanted to do a show, actually I'm planning to do a show in Germany this summer where I will have a lot of mirrors in the room and, and the mirrors will be mirroring each other. So what if you put a mirror 
really in front of the mirror, what is the mirror seeing? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm touching these questions of like mirroring versus creating, but creating in a so-called mindful way versus the I'm going to make something now. I'm creating, is that? I, I, maybe I switched the wrong word, creating versus yes. making. Or, yes. Uh, your connection with the environment. Yes. Um, with what I see here. Yes. Um, <clears throat> is that, are you uh, stimulated by your connection with the environment as opposed to connection with uh, people, situations that are just, uh, does it have to be the environment that motivates you? Well, you are the environment, so I'm, I'm stimulated by your question right now. Uh, I, I don't see you des separate from nature. Again, it's not the going out. You are nature. Uh, this is nature. Uh, this is nature. It's not the, the nature that we refer to usually, but it's part of nature. Like, I guess my question is the beauty of these pieces, and they, yes. they are beautiful. Thank um, you. I've been accused of that. <laughs> uh, some are, some pieces of work are not, quote, maybe in my mind. Yes. Uh, they're shocking. They're uh, yes. setting. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't call them beautiful, but yes. <clears throat> a certain type of beauty. I'm just speaking to you. Can yes. You, yes. I trust beauty, yes. I trust a deeper beauty. Uh, I trust a rotten apple as being beautiful in the same way I trust uh, the flowering apple trees right now at our farm as something very beautiful. Yes, yes. Uh, I do not trust shock. I, I feel there's plenty of shock. Uh, I mean, I have to close my eyes so much now and we're so exhausted as people, as individuals, as society. Uh, we're so desperate and so exhausted. Uh, no, we don't need, I don't need any more shock value of, of, of any form. I, I want the opposite. Yes, I want, I want my art, if you, if you will, if, if, you want, as a, if you want a very clear statement, I want my art to be an antidote to all that. Uh, not just an ointment, but a pointing at, at pretty much the opposite direction, yes. So if beauty occurs, um, I'd like to refer to as an, an, an in, a deeper beauty, an inner beauty, yes. yes. Not a fashion beauty, not, not what's fashionable uh, or trendy or whatever. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. You mentioned the, um, mm -hmm. the beauty of the flowering apple trees right now. Yes. How would you use that as inspiration? You wouldn't, it doesn't seem to me from what you're saying that you wouldn't paint that as you see it. Yes. You more paint it as you feel it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yes, no, I see, the f I see the blooming apple trees right now, and I see the occasional bee, and I'm very happy to see the occasional bee, and, and a bunch of wild bees, cult cultured bees and wild bees, so on. Uh, I see that, and I also see the beautiful colors, they attract me, and I see how these leaves fall, uh, and I don't know how they will enter my work. Uh, and I don't really know how these entered my work. I do see some flowers that I see in central and western Maine and all of New England that remind me of those, but they are really inventions in that sense, right? They're not 
I'm not going out there and depict the flower. There was um, Richard Feynman, Richard Feynman, the great uh, physicist, uh, 50s, 60s, talked about this little flower anecdote. You, you probably know it, uh, uh, but I, I'm saying it anyway. So he talks to his artist friend, and, and he talks about the, it's, the, it's the, the conversation about beauty between the scientist, the intellect, and the uh, artist, the creative. Uh, and, and so the, the artist says, wow, this is the painting that I ju just made. Isn't that gorgeous, a wonderful painting? And, and, and Feynman says, yes, but there's more than the beauty, than the surface, than the wonderful colors and forms and shapes and whatever. Uh, you can only understand the flower fully when you understand her origin. Where does she come from? How does she grow? Uh, and I say she because because I, th I think I think you could go that far and, and say it's it's a it's a living, creating thing that creates a flower and gets creates seeds and and it and so it's in a way a form of muttering, right? So Feynman talks about yes, I n understand the cell structure of it. I understand the biological properties of it, where it comes from, blah, 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 the whole thing. And, and, and with that, Feynman claims he has a more holistic understanding. Now, I say, unfortunately, he stopped there at the intellect, and, and, he, and he didn't include the possibility because he couldn't, because he was a very strict, very inspired, uh, brilliant, scientist, but he was a, a, a very much in his brain. And so he couldn't go the next step, which in my world would be art, A-R-T. The next step is to soak that all in, to open your eyes widely and look at the apple blossom and smell it and eat one. You will notice that they taste sweet, very interesting, uh, almost like an apple. Uh, like a little promise of an apple. Uh, so that is, that is the first step. The second step, yes, why not? We have brains and, and we have a certain intelligence. So of course it it's, might be helpful to a degree to understand the biology of, of, uh, of the flower. But what, where Feynman stopped and, and, ma and many of us stop is right there, and there is another world beyond that. And this is what, uh, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh would, in his flower analogy, would, would say, well, you are the flower, and the flower is the entire universe. He would, he, Thich Nhat Hanh would pick a flower, and I'm not, I'm not specifically he came up twice to, today, but there are many more people of that caliber. But anyway, so he would pick up a flower and say, well, can you see the clouds? And you, and you think, and you say, I mean, no, he must be a little off. Uh, and, and he says, well, think of it. What, what makes the flower? What is the flower without the sun? Do you see the sun? No. Uh, do you see the earth in the flower? No. But all these ingredients are the flower, right? And, and so um, when we look at the flower, we see the flower now, and we hopefully see a beautiful apple with a little worm in it uh, <laughs> in September. Uh, and and it is very beautiful. And, and, and maybe you see the flower, uh, the, 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 the flower that goes into the fruit and, you, and, the, and the fruit rots, and you see the little seed. And the little seed is, is, is the promise for the continuum. All right, so the Feynman flower is a good example to talk about beauty, which we touched a minute ago, right? Yes. So to go to the point you were just speaking of and talking about art, like 
your painting isn't a specific flower. It's the essence of nature, man and nature, the nature of man, everything in there. I don't want to get too much into it because you just explained it all. But knowing all that, do you ever create a particular art piece with a particular person in mind, being that you might be inspired by this person's energy or color palette that you would then go to a canvas or you know watercolor on paper and create that with the energy and essence of a person specifically that you want to paint and create for? I love people. <laughs> And I'm not desperately interested in specific people. Uh, I'm, I'm not very interested in heroes anymore either. Uh, I'm not interested in man, and you, 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 you use the word man uh, as in mankind. And, and first of all, I would call it womankind rather, uh, <laughs> just, to, just to create the, the, the the, the slight provocational for us guys, right? And 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 uh, so uh, uh, I'm interested in the source. I'm interested in beginnings. I'm interested in the beginningless of all things. And I'm interested in the short time period when no thing becomes some thing. And I'm interested how you make no thing again out of that something. Because when you see it, it's all energy and light waves and, and happenings in the brain and in the heart that create no thing. It's not an object anymore. So now I, uh, I enjoy very much listening to Bach, but, but I cannot call him my hero. And I, and I, and I think Thich Nhat Hanh and, and Long Chen Pa and and uh, T.D. Suzuki and, and, and the other Suzuki and, and many other wise people created a wonderful founda foundation for us to build upon, but they were not very much interested in themselves or they would not want any specific people. There is something that a student friend of mine does regularly, she paints paintings f having a specific person in mind. And one of, uh, I just spoke with her this morning, she painted a little, little painting, a little mandala kind of thing for a person that is going through severe um, health uh, trauma. And, and so that kind of channeling I, I take very seriously and um, I don't I, I don't mistrust that but but that's not what I do you had a question well I'm drawn very much to your plant paintings well, actually all your paintings and um, some of my question has been answered in your conversation in the last few minutes I'm going back to early on you talked about bees being uprooted to me, they have roots. Yes. Because two different ways of looking at it, I suppose. <laughs> yes. And um, when I first looked at them online, <laughs> yes. and I said, oh, they're sort of botanical and they have their roots and they're, yes. you know, they're, they're, they're renderings of yes. the plants, but, and I like seeing their roots, but they aren't in the earth. Yes. And the earth is very much part of nature, as is everything. Yes. Soil, dirt. Yes. But I, you used the word uprooted. Yes. Where in my head, they have roots. And I just wonder if you could talk to. That's a very good point. Yes, it's, it's, a very, it's, a very, uh, it's a very intelligent uh, question. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful point. And we 
between the one and the other uh, is where we create our lives. Uh, we, we, we seek for being rooted. We want rootedness. We want to connect. And I talked about connecting. And on the other hand, uh, there are all these wars going on uh, uh, that I talked about when I talked about of nature. Uh, first, there's the war against the other. And second, there's the war against yourself. And third, there's the war against nature herself, right? So we're always in that tension space between finding roots or, or feeling rooted and being uprooted uh, uh, through circumstances or the mind. The mind does a lot of uprooting, right? So I call this specifically uprooted, uh, un, like pulled out uh, to create a little provocation, a little tension in, in the room because rooted the rootedness which which is a, is rare in what we strive for on the other hand seems to be taken for granted and and we because we don't see the roots right you we don't see that the root of a tree or uh, uh, the roots of a mushroom the mycelium of a mushroom is a gigantic enterprise right a very creative connective enterprise of many, many different entities, species of the same and different. So we, but we don't see the roots. So the uprootedness I found specifically important, I guess, myself, uh, because I wanted to see these roots and, and, and how, they, how they seek maybe to root again. Uh, the chipmunk this morning uprooted one of our <laughs> our uh, plants, and Annie was very uh, very annoyed with the chipmunk that was sitting like this and saying, "Yeah, whatever. I'm just I'm doing my naturing here, right?" Yes. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to ask, um, if you have been in Maine very long, and what drew you to come? Say it again. And well, how long have you been in Maine, and what drew you to come? What drew me to come to Maine? That's kind of a little personal story. We've been living here for, we started Safford Farm 20, I'm always looking at my wife because she knows numbers. Uh, probably 20 years ago or so, yes. Uh, a tiny little anecdote, when I was 17, I uh, went from Germany. I sat in a plane with a friend of mine, and, and we flo flew to Toronto, Canada, and I wanted to find a place to build a, a log cabin. Uh, and, and so that kind of environment our environment, that environment, uh, has always been close to me. And there was uh, an opportunity at some point in our lives where I felt uh, I made a good amount of money from my art, that it felt right to give back to nature herself from which, at that point, I felt my art emerged. So, Sefford Farm is, is our way of giving back to nature what we received from her. 
that's in central, uh, in, and it says western, I, I say central Maine. So it's, <laughs> it's north of Farmington and, and a little uh, and south of Sugarloaf. Yes, yes. M hilly, close to the mountains, but not really in, uh, not too close to the mountains. Yes, is there, is there any other question or shall we close? I don't know what the time is, I don't want to. Yes. 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 So maybe maybe this is a good a good closing and and maybe I can say I, I wish you all well and 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 do good arting whichever form it takes and 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 find good moments of presence in your practice. Thank you. Thank you.